Uh, very excited this morning. It's morning over here in New Zealand and it's evening in the UK to introduce Dr. Caris Sonnenberg. Did I get that right? <laughs> yeah, Caris. Yeah, that's Karis. fine. Caris. <laughs> oh, a beautiful name, by the way. Um, Thank you so much. And it's so nice to connect with you here. I think we are both tapping into each other's work that we're putting out through various platforms, LinkedIn and other forms of social media. And it's just really nice to finally connect. I love what you're doing, supporting women through um, menopause and women's health in general. I'll just give a little overview for the listeners. So you are the founder of Rowena Health, which I've seen as an online platform to provide information and support for women in menopause. And you're also an NHS GP specializing in menopause and women's health with over 20 years experience. I'm not sure if it's 20 years total in menopause and women's health or your history as a doctor. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Firstly, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and I think our topics are amazing. So um, yes, my name's um, Karis Sonnenberg. So I, I'm a GP. I've been, um, I, I started life um, in 1996 as I qualified uh, back then. So I've been a, a doctor for a long time. I did paediatrics to start with. Um, I thought that's what I wanted to do. And I gained my membership to the Royal College of Paediatrics and I started working at Great Ormond Street. And then I had a, um, a big turnaround and decided that I wanted to be a GP um, so I could bring my paediatrics into GP so I started to do that and then I became very involved in diabetes um, and that's how I think the interest I have with menopause and metabolic syndrome comes from that um, and then women's health and contraception and now I am a GP and I lead the women's health and family planning and menopause at my practice I've set up a family planning clinic um, so I love being able to to do all the coils and the implants and and really help women because I think hormones are so important to us and if you give women so I'll give a woman a wrong hormonal contraceptive it can really affect them in every way their work their life their relationships so I'm very very particular at the history and how we counsel women um, and menopause yes became my absolute passion and yes I've really enjoyed educating on on um, social media and I set up um, Rowena Health really because um, I started to blog and realized that I love doing that and I love learning and sharing what I've learned um, and I uh, now I'm planning to set that up so I can start seeing private patients I still intend to remain um, working in the NHS because I'm very passionate that women should have um, free health care and free health information so um, they have excellent health care um, here in the UK on that so um, so yeah I'm really delighted thank you so much for having me yeah no it's excellent I mean I, I am listening to the conversation in the UK explode across menopause and of course the well, this yeah. is still world menopause month we've had world menopause week and world menopause day and it was mass massive in the UK and also here in New Zealand um, and yeah. I'm not sure whether it's because I am quite involved in this space now and I've met some incredible women meno warriors we call them our paws posse <laughs> and um yeah, it's just so cool to see, you know, all the work that's been done in the UK to support women during menopause. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's also accelerating with the conversation in menopause, and it's one of the topics we're going to talk to today, is um, I've noticed that there's an acceleration in conversation in menopause across the world and an increasing amount of brands, supplements, skincare, clothing, hair care services, and they're all pitching to women in this life stage. And there's yeah. obviously we're going to be 1 billion of us or more by the year 2025. We all have relatively, not all of us, but there's an expendable income. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of the marketing pitches that pitches to us that we're still a bit broken and therefore you can use this, it will fix you. So there's all that kind of underlying messages. This is probably a bit mm -hmm. of a contentious beginning getting to our interview um but where i'm going with this <laughs> no you're right <laughs> where yeah. i'm going words such as meno belly lose your meno belly uh take off your meno weight um take the supplement for hot flashes etc so a word that has popped up through social media and marketing is um it's a combination of words metabolic syndrome now i can explain to a woman fairly easily what metabolic syndrome is but I would like for the listeners to hear from an expert perspective, please 
with your expertise in diabetes, because I think there's a link there, um, please help us understand what is metabolic syndrome? Why does it come up for us in menopause? Okay, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm really passionate about this because I think it's really great that women look at, look at our bodies at this time in our lives and we think, right, how can we um, work out where we are just at this moment so that we can start to make some changes? Where are we with our health? What's happening to our blood pressure? What's happening to our blood lipids? Um, what's happening to our weight distribution? Um, what's happening? Why, why might we be gaining weight a little bit? What's happening to our insulin resistance? Why is our risk of heart disease going up post-menopause? Why are we more likely to become diabetic potentially if we gain weight? What's going to happen for the next phase in our lives and how can we help ourselves without spending any money on meno anything? So I don't, I truly don't believe that this has to be an expensive process. Um, it's just an awareness and it's nothing to be frightened of. It's not that you need to go and make any drastic changes, but I think it's just a perfect time to look not just at your symptoms, but beyond, because we have many years left now, potentially our, our, our um, li average life expectancies in our eighties. We've got a lot of time to live after the menopause. Um, so how, what's gonna to happen to our health through that and what risks might we be, um, what might be, we be at risk of and how can we reverse, not reverse, but how can we be aware of it and what can we do? So menopause, uh, metabolic syndrome, I listened to an amazing talk at the British Menopause Society Conference and it just totally grabbed me because of my interest in it, menopause and, and of diabetes um, is, is um, it's a collection of things. So um, we look, when we diagnose it here in the UK, uh, in Europe, you have to have a waist circumference of greater than 80 centimetres. So we know as, as, um, as we um, go through the menopause, our oestrogen drops, our testosterone oestrogen ratio changes, and we may gain a bit of weight in the middle. Um, and that increases our risk of metabolic syndrome and of um, type two diabetes. Um, so we want to be walking so that we can try and it's free any exercise you want to do anything you enjoy get that get out of breath get try and look at that weight we also um, find our lipid blood lipids change so uh, naturally the estrogen goes down and an effect of that would be to increase our LDL cholesterol our triglycerides and we find that our HDL goes down. So if you look at lipids, I very simply look at lipids in being um, lipoproteins and fats. So you have your total cholesterol, cholesterol is made in your liver, you eat some as well in your fats, so you want to be having good intake of fats, so making sure that your fats are healthy fats. Um, and then you have your LDL cholesterol, which is um, low density lipoprotein, which contains quite a lot of fat and a little bit of protein. And that goes around your body. And that's the one that you need to worry about. That's the one that's gonna stick to the macrophages in an inflammatory way and sit down in the form of foam cells on your arteries and the inside of your arteries. And that's when you could get your plaque formation. If you have a plaque and the plaque shoots off, you're, mo you're more likely to get an event like a heart attack or a stroke. So you don't want that LDL at high, high levels in your body. You want to have that nice and low. And we naturally, as we become menopausal, find that goes up. Our HDL cholesterol, it contains more protein and less fat, and that takes the cholesterol from the cells back to the liver so that it can be excreted. We need cholesterol in our body. It's not that we don't want any because we need to have it to make our vitamin D and our sex hormones. So um, our, um, our estrogen and progesterone come from cholesterol. Um, so it's really important to have that, but you want to have the balance right. And the balance changes in menopause. We find triglycerides go up and this may be an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So these things are happening in our bodies and how, how can, what can we do about those? What, how can we help that? And exercise is another way of helping it. Um, we can also look, talk later about hormone replacement therapy and the effect that that has on your blood lipids. Um, we also find um, blood pressure goes up in uh, menopause. So uh, about half of ladies who are 60 years and older may have high blood pressure. Um, and, and you would only know that if you go and get that checked. So it's certainly worth a really good health check at this time in your life. Get your blood pressure checked, get your fasting lipids checked, 
wear yourself, look at your waist circumference um, and, and see, right, what could I do to, to make things better for myself? We find that our glucose tolerance also changes at this point. And lots of people speak about insulin resistance. There's this big thing. So mm. if I very, I, I like to explain things in a basic way so I can get them. So, um, so essentially, if you eat something sugary, now it could be a starchy carbohydrate or it could be a, a sweet, it, the glucose goes into your bloodstream. Your, glu your insulin then is secreted from your pancreas to try and help that glucose enter the cell. So if there's insulin resistance, then it's like someone's behind the door trying to stop the insulin from opening the door to let the glucose pass on in so that it can join to the Krebs cycle, go through all of that to try and make energy for our body. But the glucose is waiting and after a while, it's thinking, okay, I'm never gonna get into this cell. I'm gonna go to the liver and be made into glycogen. Um, and and the, glyco the liver's like, great, come on in. Yeah, make into glycogen, store you here. But actually it can't take all of it. So, and then the rest of it goes to the adipose tissue and it sits quite happily there in the fat cells. It, the door's open for as much of it as is going to be settled down. So, um, and also we know that in menopause, our fat cells secrete estrone, which is a type three estrogen, and our body's quite like having a bit of estrogen around. So we're going to naturally want to gain a little bit of weight. Plus we are probably a little bit less active as we get older. Maybe our joints ache and we haven't got time. A lot of us sit far too much and it's not great and I know you probably know this is that you know exercising for five or you know even half an hour a day and then sitting for the rest of the day is not good for us mm -hmm. so there are lots of things that happen to our bodies that make us more prone to metabolic syndrome so our blood pressure our lipids um, our glucose tolerance uh, our coagulability and our, our weight distribution all change and this increases our risk of cardiovascular disease and of type 2 diabetes and um, cardiovascular disease is a big killer in women um, so so um, we look at coronary microvascular disease in women goes is, is four times more common than men. Um, if we have a heart attack as a woman, we're 38% likely, 38% of us will die within a year in comparison wow. to 25% of men. So we don't want these LDL high LDL around we don't want to be gaining weight increasing our risk of diabetes because once we've got diabetes that also that that trebles our risk of cardiovascular disease in women whereas it doubles it in men so women need to look after their bodies we need to know what's happening in there we need to think we not, need not to worry about it because that is not going to help but what we do need to do is take some action so if we're smoking we need to think okay this really I really have to stop now and if we're relying on food as comfort because we're feeling unwell you know with our menopausal symptoms um, psychologically um, then then we might have to think okay we've got to redefine what we see as the word treat um, so I was speaking to someone else about this and we often look at the, at the word treat as being something that makes us feel nice and that will often be associated with some chocolate or some sugar or something that we think okay we're well, gonna have a treat now and we'll say to our children here you go here's a treat and yeah. we should not we should be using the word treat for your carrot stick or something which makes them think psychologically oh, this is good this is a treat so um th th you know it doesn't all have to be related to sugar um so psychologically we can we don't turn to those things which which make us uh gain weight and and actually make us feel really ill um and and are really bad for our body um so we need to look at how we are looking at our stress um at how much alcohol we're eating whether we're eating enough fruit and vegetables um so really take this time in life to think right i'm going to future proof my body <laughs> for the rest of the the rest of the time i've got here yeah um Car Car Caris. <laughs> Caris. Yeah. Caris, yeah. <laughs> It's called brain fog, and we're going to talk about that a bit sooner. But <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, this was actually the very catalyst to uh, once I realised I had I was in perimenopause, and I've said this a couple of times on episodes before. I decided that I was going to try my hardest to figure out how to have a long and healthy future, and I knew that getting through menopause was part of it. Um, so just trying to figure out all the pieces of, you know, the, the movement side, nutrition, stress, um, sleep massively. I actually started with sleep um, and then, you know, joy and community, the things that light you up. So it became kind of a bit of a mission to go, oh, I don't want to try to retain, you know, my 
striations in my shoulders or anything stupid like that. It became how can I move well for the rest of my life and what do I need to be able to do to do that? And I realized that, yeah, menopause was going to be a bit of a hurdle. Um, But what it did was it actually really changed the way I felt about my future. I started to see, without fear, the potential of um, heart disease. Like, even as a really fit person, like, unless I made those lifestyle changes, I would just be another statistic as well. So I did Mm -hmm. kind of realize that um, all the work that you can do now in your mid-40s and through menopause is actually setting you up for a pretty good chance of a a good long healthy life I think that's a mind shift for us as women because we get hung up on the weight gain that happens relatively quickly for for women as they enter perimenopause it is something that feels almost out of control and that might that that there's a jump on the bandwagon of I've got to exercise more and I've got to start eating less so those two things happen and they actually don't really help with the weight gain. <laughs> it's it's just so confusing for women, isn't it? So I feel like if we're able to shift our mind around the future health, what we can do today, you know, the weight can slowly, it will slowly cut back if you can continue to move well and eat healthily. It, you'll be able to sort that out. But it's just like you don't want to be that statistic for, you know, a heart attack. And like you said, people aren't aware that it's actually the biggest killer of women. We we think, you know, that it's breast cancer. I don't know. I speak to people all the time. Yeah. What do you think the number one killer of women is? And they always say breast cancer. I'm like, no, yeah. it's not. It's heart yes. disease, right? Interesting. It's really, really interesting. I, I often say to people um, and when we talk about this, and and I imagine what it must be like if you had a heart attack and how you would feel with your confidence and your worry for the future for the rest of your life. So, um, because often, you know, we have amazing healthcare, don't we, now in the world, in in parts of the world. So um, there's every likelihood that you would um, survive. And then, um, so, but you just don't want to have to ever go through that if it's possible. Some, for some people, it won't be possible. You could live the healthiest of lifestyles and, and that is, there are some non-modifiable risk factors that you cannot do anything about. Um, and certainly this isn't a time to worry exactly. I totally agree with what you said, to try and worry about every single thing you eat and you must be out there, you know, walking 50 miles a day. I mean, that's not, not the case, but they, there may be some little things that you could step by step improve so that you because we want to flourish don't we we as women want to have it all and there's no reason we can't do that we and we don't want to stop it whenever it we don't want to stop we have we want to be as healthy as possible for later we want to be that 90 year old that's cycling yes. up the hill yes. in the, I have them come to me sometimes and they're like oh sorry doctor it took me a little while to get in and I was going oh my goodness if I look like you at 90 and I'm able to do the things you do and they generally have been active through their whole lives and I really noticed that one thing I think it's the activity that's so exciting and so good and it makes our joints feel better it makes us feel better yeah um you mentioned and I think we've already touched on sort of the lifestyle aspect of managing metabolic syndrome um you've given a great explanation thank you so much what about HRT so how does HRT influence the turnaround or potential turnaround of metabolic syndrome so it's very interesting. Um, it, it so HRT has a beneficial effect on your blood lipids. So it uh, reduces your total cholesterol. It reduces your HDL cholesterol. And depending on whether you take it transdermally or whether you take it orally, it has an effect both on your LDL cholesterol, on your HDL cholesterol. Did I just say that right? It reduces your total cholesterol, reduces your LDL. LDL. And then um, depending on, yeah, LDL. And depending on whether you have um, it orally or transdermally, it has an effect on your HDL and your triglycerides. Um, so it has a beneficial effect on, on your, on your lipids, actually quite a considerably good beneficial effect. It also, now there is some controversy. Some people think it doesn't reduce blood pressure and others think it may. Um, but it certainly doesn't, doesn't appear to consistently increase your blood pressure. So, um, so uh, I've read different things, the blood pressure, it, it, I would suggest it has a good effect on blood pressure. It certainly does. Now, 
Estrogen has a beneficial effect on insulin resistance. Um, so we know that that helps reduce our insulin resistance or make us more insulin sensitive. So make the insulin work better. So therefore that should help. But the progestogen part of how we take our HRT can blunt that estrogen benefit. So we know that taking micronized progesterone, which is a body identical progesterone we have here in the UK, and I think that's probably the same for where you are, is, derived yeah. from the yam plant. Um, yeah. We think that is the best one metabolically for us. Um, so, um, and the, the effect on weight, um, a lot of people worry about taking HRT because they think it may gain weight, and that isn't the case. Um, we think that it will increase your insulin sensitivity, um, and it may have a beneficial effect on your weight. So we know that using the HRT can um, have a beneficial effect on your metabolic syndrome, So uh, and also uh, reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. I'm sure you've spoken about the 10-year uh, window. So when we're looking at reduction in cardiovascular disease, we want to start our HRT in perimenopause when our symptoms start potentially, or certainly within 10 years of our last menstrual period. So we all, all under the age of 60, we know from lots of studies that that, um, that will then, H taking HRT will reduce our risk of cardiovascular disease. It, but if you have your last period at 55, you have till 65 to gain that window of opportunity. Um, we also know that if we give you, we start HRT beyond the age of 60, and a lot of ladies do want to do that now because they know that there are benefits, um, uh, other benefits are low in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same over there. We are only licensed, HRT is only licensed for symptom control. Yeah, um, so, but if you yeah, do want to start it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you want to start it above the age of 60, you can do that. It's not going to increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. But if you had a heart attack, they would stop it and they would be started a couple of months later. Yeah. Um, so you don't want an unstable patient with unstable angina or, you know, uh, uh, to, to be taking uh, those hormones at that time. Um, but that's OK, because you can go back on it after that point um, and it will help with your symptoms then. So there's a lot of beneficial effects um, of HRT that we know with also bone protection we know that it will prevent osteoporosis um and that's a huge thing because lots of if you if you fracture a, a bone um then uh your the the chance of you dying within a year if you fracture your hip is about 30 percent and the chances of um of you being able to not self-care afterwards is about 50 yeah. percent so yeah. we don't want to do those things either so we want but but if you cannot take hrt and i am aware there is an enormous divide of whether this is the right thing for us to do or not and often women cannot take it because of of estrogen dependent um breast cancer um there are other things that you can do so exercising looking at your lifestyle stopping the smoking um looking at your diet reducing your alcohol reducing stress is a massive effect on women we all live under a lot of stress and stress is great you know if you're working in a e for the night and you've got sick patient you need to have adrenaline coming yeah up. it's good for you but you don't want but you wouldn't want to work in a &E under that that sort of um pressure for weeks the time, <laughs> that really yeah. wouldn't be good yeah, yeah. exactly you yeah. need adrenaline it makes you function well but not all the time yeah. and sleep as you said so important we know sleep so important anyone with insomnia um you know it, and, and 40 to 60 percent of women do develop insomnia and sleeping problems as they go through menopause we know that that increases your risk of mental health problems um and also sleep is hugely affecting when you're looking at your diet um uh, and and metabolic syndrome so we need to just be Take it not obsessively, but but taking a look at how we can make some improvements, not burning the candle at both ends, which used to be super fashionable, didn't it? Um, <laughs> now, now it really isn't. <laughs> Well, I can ha put my hand up and go, I've had adrenal fatigue. So definitely I was burning the candle at both ends, um, career-wise mm -hmm. and socially, like, you know, doing all yeah. the things. Yeah. And I ended up with adrenal fatigue. And so that would have been early 40s, which kind yeah. of was a precursor to perimenopause. Now I look back on these things and I go, I wish I knew all of this, you know? Like, I wish oh, that course. I knew that how the adrenals affect um, recovery and how sleep is so important and how your you know your um your hormones change from this point in time like i just those three basic things would have been really fantastic to know in advance <laughs> i agree 
Um, yes, a lot of us that can look back and think, oh, if only. Oh, yeah, if only, right? Oh, and then having a baby at 42. Yeah, maybe that didn't help either. Um, so one of the things I just wanted to say from a personal perspective with HRT is I um, put into practice all the lifestyle foundations, I call it. So moving, healthy eating, I changed a lot of things, obviously started with sleep. Um I noticed when I went on HRT and the reason that I went on HRT was I was still getting some um, joint pain and the joint mm -hmm. pain was happening while I was sleeping. So it was kind of waking me at the same time. And ah. um, the other thing was motivation. Now, people that know mm -hmm. me know I'm quite a motivated person. I get a lot of shit done, you know, like that is my my modus operandi. I, I, can, I, I really like to be creative and get content out there, really help people. But there was a period of time where I just couldn't be asked. And the other part to that was I couldn't focus like for more than five minutes. I'd sit down to do something and, and then I couldn't remember what it was I was doing. And we're going to mm -hmm. talk about this as well, about, you know, cognition and, and the everything. Brain. Yeah. 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 It was when I introduced HRT as the icing on the cake to all the other things I was doing that I got that mojo back. Now, it makes me think. For women that are struggling with weight gain, sudden weight gain during perimenopause, maybe if they considered HRT, just that level of motivation that I that I got, like that feeling of I slept better and now I feel like I want to do something. Yeah. I think that it was a game changer, like feeling like you could actually physically go out for a walk and not feel massively exhausted or you're not yeah. mentally battling yourself with, oh, no, I can't be bothered because... I could be bothered <laughs> when I was on HRT, yeah. you know, HRT was great. And I'm not one yeah. to push it. I always say, hey, look, you know, your foundations are essential. But it does make me think, well, sometimes someone just needs that patch, that, you know, utrogestin or whatever, to kind of give it a kickstart, you know? Like, and it's yeah. something that I think about quite a lot. And it's not fact here. Nothing I'm saying is fact. You're giving the facts. So I'm giving, like, like the opinion um, but it, it does make me think, yeah, maybe it does help women get off the couch and do the thing that they love doing that for quite a long time, they started to feel really down about it. Um, yeah. so yeah, that's just a, an observation. Yeah. I think that is absolutely right for lots of people. Um, and I, uh, I, um, I think people don't realize the effect that a reduction in estrogen has upon them um, until, and, and I don't think you can truly emphasize unless you have experienced it, in my opinion. Um, so, so, so for my own personal experience, which is not fact-based or anything, um, I was troubled terribly by night sweats um, for three months, took me to realize what was going on. But the brain fog was like something I'd never experienced in my life. There was no way I could have read any, there's no way I could be on social media talking about anything because I, I wouldn't be able to remember anything yeah. I couldn't I couldn't even I couldn't read an article because I couldn't have got through the first five minutes um I couldn't concentrate on anything I was enormously anxious um and and uh, and yeah brain fog it was it was so difficult that I almost couldn't work people would come in to see me and I'd think what is the name of that drug for pain beginning with p and I I couldn't even remember it. I couldn't think of the word paracetamol and I'd walk past people that I'd worked with for 10 years and I'd think I genuinely can't remember what they're called. Um, yep. And it was so terrible. Terrifying. I, I, it was very scary. And I wondered if I was ever going to be the same again. Um, and I did start to take HRT. Um, and because I just needed to, to get back to how I was. And thankfully, it has been brilliant. And I couldn't feel better. But it took a while for my brain function to recover. Okay. Um, and, and, and the night sweats were very quick. But yeah, the brain, and I couldn't work out what on earth was wrong with me. Um, but I was all over the place and it you know, really wasn't nice at all. It's so um, nice to hear doctors and experts speak from their own personal experience as well, because I think oftentimes, yeah. you know, we look to you as the experts. We never really hear that you've gone through this as well. Yeah, um, yeah. I have a Facebook, private Facebook group, and um, I coordinate with Dr. Linda Deer, who's a menopause specialist here in New Zealand. We actually live in the same place so we can't coordinate uh, how to do yeah. the live where she's on one <laughs> it's not like instagram live which is quite easy but so we actually get together sit in the same room and have a discussion and she often gives personal 
stories about her experience. And I think for that reason, that has made her so, um, people have just gravitated towards her stories and of course her expertise. So I do think that there's yeah. a lot to be said for doctors that share their own personal experiences. It's awesome. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think it sometimes helps, but um, just to note, yeah, yeah, all doctors. In fact, I went away with my lovely um, university friends for the weekend. I thought I'll have a weekend off. Yes. It was not a weekend off, we're all menopausal, so we had patches floating off in the hot tub, insomnia, terrible anxiety, tears, you know, I mean, we, we were all in it together, and, and you know, they, they are so consultants, fun. psychiatrists, they are, um, you know, consultants in, in paediatrics, and, and they genuinely were as flummoxed by the whole thing when it hit them, as someone who has no medical training in it whatsoever. I read something um, recently, the, uh, uh, an NHS... Uh, about NHS doctors resigning or NHS staff resigning because they were struggling with the menopause and how we should understand what's happening to our bodies. And I can truly say that I don't think many women understand what's going on with their bodies until they are sometime into the menopause, if it affects them in, in a way that they're not having hot flushes, which often happen late anyway. Um, yeah. Because for me, it took me I was 44, probably, 43, 44. To be honest, I wonder if I've been estrogen deficient for a long time prior to that, because my, my concentration was going down. But I um, I didn't know. I didn't know for a long time. And I was dealing with the menopause a lot. I just didn't know what was happening to me. That is <laughs> wild that you're seeing it all the time and then you're not thinking about... I just didn't actually. think it was yeah. going to happen to me at that age, yes. Yeah. And, and I, I genuinely didn't know. Yeah. Um, took me a long time. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Um, we're actually going to segue into something you've already brought up, which is, you know, brain yeah. fog and cognitive function. Yeah. So I'd like to know the effect of estrogen on brain function, the role that okay. estrogen has in cognitive and emotional symptoms of menopause. Can you share with us, like, yeah, how important yeah, is estrogen for that? Because we've both obviously had brain fog and forgetfulness and focus mm -hmm. issues. And I mean, it's like in your situation, <laughs> not giving the right medication is like, that's a bit scary. Mine is just yeah. like not forgetting, not picking up my children from school, like that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, I forgot to do. <laughs> yeah, I forgot times. lots of things. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I am fascinated by this. So estrogen, um, you know, is not just a hormone; it modulates the neurotransmitters in our brain. So I did a lot of reading about this um, in February. Um, so it, we look at our GABA and our, our glutamate and our dopamine um, and our serotonin, and estrogen has a, has an effect upon these in the brain. So um, when we look at why we can't remember things, that's loss of verbal recall people always worry oh I genuinely think I'm having an early dementia and I have to say no don't worry it's a loss of verbal recall and it's caused because glutamate modulates uh, so estrogen modulates glutamate so it upregulates glutamate um, and it means and glutamate is our learning or uh, neurotransmitter so if we have low estrogen levels we'll find lower glutamate levels which makes it more difficult for us to recall things um, plus we'll see some changes in the hippocampus which is our memory part of our brain so estrogen has a huge effect everywhere in the body all the cells and and in the brain particularly we'll also see that it has an effect upon serotonin um, so that it, we know that serotonin receptors are also in our gut and in our brain um, so it will it will have an effect upon our mood serotonin is our happy hormone so if we find that we're finding estrogen upregulates serotonin so if we're finding high, lower levels of serotonin that may well affect our mood as well um, now interestingly um, uh, it, it it has an effect upon GABA, but so does progesterone. So when we stop, so if you're suffering, for example, um, premenstrual syndrome or PMDD, do you call it there? Um, mm -hmm. So severe premenstrual syndrome, you'll find that when you ovulate, um, you, your progesterone in your ovary um, is produced by your corpus luteum after you've ovulated. So that goes up in the second half of your cycle, which is your luteal phase of your cycle. And it falls again um, just before your period if you're not pregnant and that's then you have a period. So you may notice the effects of progesterone, which can make you a bit calmer, a bit sleepier, but you still might suffer from sleeping problems during that second part in your cycle. Mm. Um, the best time to sleep is during ovulation, um, it, apparently, in a normal cycle. Um, but progesterone, um, some women approximately 
ultimately, from what I've read, 15% of women suffer from intolerance to that. So in some women, we give them progesterone and it has a beneficial effect on GABA. So we find it calms you down. GABA is very calming and, and, and relaxing. Um, but uh, in other women, um, the metabolite of, of progesterone, which is allopregnanolone, goes up into the brain and has an entirely different effect. And you know how when you um, speak to people and they say, I cannot tolerate that pill. It drives me crazy. Yeah. You know, my boyfriend is saying, look, I'm, I can't carry on with you like this. So often those women respond to the metabolite of the progestogen or their own progesterone by making the allopregnanolone, and that has a dramatic effect on the GABA receptor in a different way and causes them to have premenstrual syndrome or postnatal depression. Also, they, they, we can, our hormones can affect our neurotransmitters in different ways. Um, so those particular women may interact or interact may, may be intolerant of contraception any sort of synthetic contraception so when you a lot of people don't realize and in fact it took me many years of working with women to realize this that progestogens have very different effects upon women mm. so if you go in and you get a particular prescription of a pill and it might have say uh gestadine as your progesterone in it or levonorgestrel um and and sometimes women will come back. Then oh, that pill doesn't suit me, and you'll you'll pluck another one out and think, oh, maybe this one will do the trick. And that isn't the right thing to do. It's really important to have have a very good history. Think: Is it the estrogen? Is it the progesterone? Which one should we try next? So there are ones. One uh, there's one called uh, drospirinone, which we now try and use as a combined contraceptive pill for those women who have premenstrual syndrome um, to stabilise the hormones. And we think that one maybe uh, maybe choose less allopregnanolone, which will therefore cause less problems in the brain in the GABA receptors for those women that are very sensitive. So we're not all the same with our brains and how we respond to our sex hormones up there. Um, but we we think that oestrogen. Um, certainly has an effect upon glutamate, an effect upon serotonin and upon dopamine. We now look at a lot of women having trouble with their um, ADHD um, yeah. when they are uh, menopausal and we know that oestrogen has an effect upon dopamine which then therefore may, may have an effect upon ADHD which we know can get worse um, at the round of the time of the menopause as can PMS, premenstrual syndrome, um, because of the huge fluctuations you know some months you ovulate some months you don't then you might have a really heavy period that goes on for ages because you haven't had your normal ovulation and your progesterone you just have this anovulatory cycle that goes on and on and on yeah. <laughs> it's really heavy and then yeah. you become anemic and you know it, there's so many things that happen with hormones in our bodies that just so fascinating We're also individual with how we respond to them um, so yeah, that that's how it um, it 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 happens. It's really incredible. Really yeah, it is. It is it. super interesting. So um, mm. I um, follow Dr. Lara Bryden, who's down here in New Zealand. She wrote the Period Revolutionary. Um, so there's some mm -hmm. really interesting content in there, and she's got some quite strong opinions around um, contraception. Obviously, contraception yeah. is synthetic, so you are having a yeah. medical cycle when you're on contraception. Yeah. Um, and a lot of women don't realise that HRT is actually uh, as close to our hormones as you can possibly get, yes. isn't it? So yes, it's, it's, absolutely. It's even more natural than, say, a contraceptive pill because I was on yeah. the pill for oh, 20, yeah. 20 years. So I was having medical cycles, medical periods, yeah. uh, induced periods for 20 years before you know deciding to have a child. And never mm -hmm. once did I consider that, um, that that's, you know, that it, it, it's synthetic. Then, so then I have mm -hmm. doubts around HRT. Oh, hey, I've got to find out about this because I'm not sure <laughs> whether yes. it's a good thing I should be taking it. But then after listening to Dr. Lara and, and speaking with a few other people, just realizing, hey, this is actually as close to natural as I can possibly get. When we talk yes. about body identical, you know. Um, yeah, so. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it really has helped with cognitive function. Obviously, so many women have said that you know they they feel more clear like the the name dropping thing um when you can't forget someone's name it's so scary do you remember did you ever have this <laughs> yeah. happen where you're sitting with a friend and you're meeting another friend and the other friend's going to come over and you're going to have to introduce them and you cannot remember <laughs> how bad is that <laughs> I've had that, yeah, and I've been trying to think. One thing I say is, I normally you're, you're trying to remember a film and the and the um, and the actor in the film, and you can't remember either. But you can remember maybe the first name of the actor, and that the film had airplanes in it, and yeah. it might be that he began with a T, and yeah. he was wearing a red top. So I'm trying to have my conversation with my husband, and he's going, "Is it just Top Gun with or Tom Cruise?" I mean, <laughs> yes, that's it. I've got it. 
<laughs> so, uh, Tom. <laughs> Yeah, all of it. It's just so frustrating. Yeah. I found I actually stopped um, wanting to go out to talk with people because I thought people are going to think I'm completely stupid because I can't remember anything anymore. I can't can't actually have an intelligent conversation because no words are coming to me anymore. Um, And and I had to get my phone out. It's going, okay, if you ask me to do a job, all right, I've got to email myself. I I just started constantly writing lists of things that I needed to remember because I knew there was no point in trying to remember it otherwise. Yeah. I mean, I think I still write lists now, but I that my chances of forgetting things are much, much lower, which is great. But for a yeah. woman who are uh, going, you know what, I want to go 100% natural and I'm not interested in HRT, then my advice would be you've got to double down on your sleep, you know, like yeah. because it is it, it feels like that. So, you know, brain fog, forgetfulness, losing focus, demotivation, they're also um, symptoms of sleeplessness. So, yeah. you know, like if that, that's probably one of the things I'd recommend if you're going, okay, you, I don't want to take HRT. I'm like, well, you know, really focus on your sleep because it's going to help so many things. And yeah. yeah, there's, there's a lot of concern about taking HRT. And all I would suggest is that um, you really find out as much as you can about it before you worry, before you, you say yes or no, um, and make sure that you're finding out your evidence from people who are really knowledgeable. Um, so they're going to be able to tell you the facts because I often get people in, for example, saying, oh no, I, I can't start HRT again because I'm going to start bleeding. And I have to say, well, actually, you know, you've got all these symptoms and, and you, you're now a couple of years after your periods have stopped. So we don't have to give you a bleed preparation of HRT. Um, and and I sit down and truly counsel them with the risks, the benefits, and everything. And they go, "Oh my gosh, I didn't know. I simply didn't know." And yes, please, can I have some? Yeah. So um, it's really, and I never persuade anyone ever to do anything. All I say, my job is to provide you with the information and it is your job to decide what you would like to do for your body. Um, so when people say, what What do you think or what's the best one? I, I have to say, it's totally your opinion. You're in control, it's your body. You decide what you do with it. You decide what you put into it. These are the things we currently know. Things may change in 10, 20 years time. You may have much more evidence. We may be really using much more estrogen to try and prevent all these um, conditions, or we may know different things. We just don't know. We can only go with what we know at the moment. I mean, we mustn't let it worry us. We must just do our best because that's all we can do. Yeah, that's true. And Dr. Karras, you've been absolutely phenomenal. Um, I'm deeply passionate about all the things you were talking about. You're going through all the different hormones and I'm thinking my light, my head is lighting up. <laughs> all the neurons are lighting up. It's a little bit of estrogen, a bit of estrogen in there too. So that helps. Um, so thank you so much for um, sharing your knowledge with us. And I will put in the show notes how listeners might be able to contact you. Um, you've got various social platforms, but you've also got your website and I'll put it in there as well. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.